Okay. Um, good afternoon, or if you're Aileen, good morning. Uh, <laughs> welcome to our session, our special roundtable, White Resentment and Economic Anxiety, Reflections on the Writings of David R. Rodiger, a signature event in the American Studies Association Freedom Courses online conference. I want to just remind everybody who's with us and viewing that we are recording this session, that you, there is a live transcript available if you want to view that. And also, if you have questions, to put them in the Q&A. We, we plan to have plenty of time left for questions at the end. So my name is Jeannie O'Brien. I teach at the University of Minnesota in History and American Indian Studies and American Studies. And I'm really thrilled to be a part of this roundtable. Um, and I want to thank Scott Kirshagi for, for uh, organizing it. Um, this is a roundtable that reflects on the immensely important contributions of Dave Rodiger on race, whiteness, working class and labor history, and well, history, American studies, critical race and ethnic studies in general. I had the great privilege of calling Dave a colleague at Minnesota back in the day, and I'm so honored to be able to call him a treasured friend. I could go on, but we have six fantastic panelists lined up for today, and we'll also hear from Dave in the end. This stellar cast includes three former ASA presidents, Scott uh, Kurashigi, and uh, who I'd like to thank for organizing the session, plus Robert Warrior and Dave Rodiger himself. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce all of the panelists at once, um, partly just because of the technology of Zoom. Uh, our first speaker, uh, we are thrilled to have Aileen Morton Robinson, who is a Gunpel woman of Quadramuka people, Morton Bay, and is professor of indigenous research and elder scholar in residence at our MIT University. She is Australia's first indigenous distinguished professor appointed in 2016, and is a founding member of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, NISA. Aileen is author of Talking Up to the White Woman, Indigenous Women and Feminism, UQP, the White Possessive, Property, Power, and Indigenous Sovereignty, Minnesota Press, and the editor of several books, including Critical Indigenous Studies, Engagements in First World Locations, University of Arizona Press. In 2020, she was appointed an honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Manu Karuka is the author of Empire's Tracks, Indigenous Nations, Chinese Workers, and the Transcontinental Railroad, published by the University of California Press. He is a co-editor with Juliana Hupagiz and Alyosha Goldstein of a special issue of Theory and Event on Colonial Unknowing. And he is a co-chair with Vivek Balk, Miyaba Chatterjee, and Sujandi Reddy of The Sun Never Sets, South Asian Migrants in the Age of US Power from NYU Press. He is an assistant professor of American studies at Barnard College. Rebecca Hill is professor of American studies in the Interdisciplinary Studies Department at Kennesaw State University. She is the author of Men, Mobs, and Law, Anti-Lynching and Labor Defense in U.S. Radical History, which began as a dissertation at the University of Minnesota in the 1990s, where she was mentored by both Drs. Rodiger and O'Brien. She is currently working on a book on anti-fascist politics in the U.S. and is the author of a new essay on fascism for Keywords in American Cultural Studies, third edition, available now at NYU Virtual Press Booth and co-editor with Elizabeth Duclos Orsello and Joseph Enton of the forthcoming collection, Teaching American Studies, State of the Classroom as State of the Field, which will be available from the University Press of Kansas in early summer, 2021. Minka Makalani is associate professor in the departments of American, uh, excuse me, of African and African Diaspora Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the author of In the Cause of Freedom, Radical Black Internationalism from Harlem to London, 1917 to 1939, and Escape from New York, The New Negro Renaissance Beyond Harlem. He is currently working on two book projects, Calypso Conquered the World, CLR James and the Politically Unimaginable in Trinidad, and Words Past the Margin, Black Thought and the Impossible. Scott Kurshigi is professor and chair in the Department of Comparative Race and Ethnic Studies at Texas Christian University and past president of the ASA. He is the author or co-author of four books, The Shifting Grounds of Race, Black and Japanese Americans in the Making of Multi-Ethnic Los Angeles, The Next American Revolution, Sustainable Activism for the 21st Century with Grace Lee Boggs, Exiled to Motown, History of Japanese Americans in Detroit, and 50 Year Rebellion, How the US Political Crisis Began in Detroit. Robert Warrior is Hall Distinguished Professor of American Literature and Culture at the University of Kansas and is a member citizen of the Osage Nation. He is the author of Tribal Secrets, Recovering American Indian Intellectual Traditions, The People in the Word, 
reading native nonfiction and co-author of Like a Hurricane, the Indian Movement from Alcatraz to Wounded Knee, American Literary, Na Indian Literary Nationalism and Reasoning Together, the Native Critics Collective. Past president of the ASA, he is a co-founder and first president of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association and inaugural co-editor with me of the association's journal, Native American and Indigenous Studies. Finally, David Rodiger is the foundation professor of American studies at the University of Kansas, where he teaches and writes on race and class in the United States. Educated through college at public schools in Illinois, he completed doctoral work at Northwestern University. Winner of many awards for his important scholarship, Dave's re recent books include Seizing Freedom, Slave Emancipation and Liberty for All, How Race Survived U.S. History, and with Elizabeth Ash, The Production of Difference. His older writings on race, immigration, and working class history include Wages of Whiteness and Working Towards Whiteness. His new book, The Sinking Middle Class, A Political History, was released just last month. To steal the words of George Lipsitz, this book is brilliant and insightful, explores the ways in which appeals to save the middle class in electoral politics harm the very constituencies they purport to help. So without further ado, Aileen. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> Right. Thank you, Jenny. Um, you're everyone and good morning from Australia. Um, as is Indigenous custom, I pay my respects to the Native American tribes on Turtle Island and other Indigenous peoples tuned into this panel. I acknowledge the life force of Mother Earth, our non-human relatives, and the existence of ancestors and elders who have gone before. I thank American Studies Association past presidents Scott and Robert for the invitation to participate on this panel. And of course, our beautiful chair, Jeannie O'Brien for the introduction. When I was invited to speak on this panel, I did not hesitate to accept as it provided an opportunity to pay homage to a scholar I respect and admire. My relationship with Professor Rodiger's work began in 2004. I went to a secondhand book sale at the University of Queensland in Brisbane. Upon entry to the sale, I gravitated to a table with a large pile of books. I rummaged through them and one caught my attention. The title was Towards the Abolition of Whiteness by David Rodiger. I did not know of David Rodiger, but that title intrigued me. And as it was a bargain at $15, I was compelled to buy the book. After reading it, I decided I wanted to meet this person for it was rare to find a white male scholar who acknowledged his intellectual debt to black scholarship. At the time I was the president of the Australian Critical Race and Whiteness Studies Association. So I invited Professor Rodiger to present a keynote at our inaugural conference in 2005. And as they say, the rest is history. Meeting David Rodiger proved to be one of the highlights of my professional life. At the association's conference, Professor Rodiger's keynote set the tone for the event and enabled fertile and robust discussions regarding the formation of white national identity in the USA and Australia. After the conference, David accepted an invitation to be on the editorial board of the association's new journal, which helped increase its status and reputation within the field. Over time, I learned that Professor Rodiger's generosity of spirit and collegiality was an integral part of his professional and ethical practice, evidenced by the numerous professional contributions made to the development of academic associations, committees and editorial boards. Many junior and senior academics from across the globe have benefited from his mentoring and support. Professor Rodiger's corpus has been foundational to building a global field of critical whiteness and race studies, and one cannot do justice to it in 10 minutes. So I'm focused on, focusing on the work that influenced me. In what is now considered a seminal text, The Wages of Whiteness, Race and the Making of the American Working Class, published in 1991, contributes to academic discourse on race and labour beyond the USA. In this book, Rodiger argues that working class racism cannot be reduced purely to economic advantage over blacks, as it also requires ideological and psychological investments and commitments 
to the production of white superiority and black inferiority in the formation of white identities. Rodiger extended this work in towards the abolition of whiteness to argue race is socially constructed and whiteness is predicated on a set of vacuous characteristics that need to be exposed and erased. He advocates for an effective politics to dismantle and abolish whiteness. Race, class, labour history and politics are the consistent threads woven through most of Rodiger's historical materialism and he consistently pays tribute to some of the great black thinkers who shaped his learnings, particularly W.E.B. Du Bois. His edited collection in Black on White, Black Writers on What It Means to Be White, published in 1998, showcased black scholarship on whiteness. As I read the essays by Zora Neale Hurston, Cheryl Harris, Tony Morris, Alice Walker, James Baldwin, Derek Bell and Frederick Douglass, to name a few, I was overcome with intellectual excitement. For it was evident that their scholarship conceptualised whiteness as a form of power and property, as supremacy, as hegemony, as ideology and ontology. And it was certainly not invisible, unnamed or unmarked. Rodiger's political and intellectual allegiance with black scholarship gave access to the world to an edited collection centering black epistemology. In how race survived US history from settlement and slavery to the Obama phenomenon, published in 2010 is where dispossession, slavery and migration are brought together by Roe Digger where he exposes how the idea of race shaped the colonization of North America, continuing into the 21st century. Following Dubois, Rodiger shows that from the 17th century, whiteness gained traction and took hold through the American Revolution, the Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and the emergence of the American Empire. And while race intersects with other forms of oppression in America, it remains central determining which racialized category one is assigned to and what privileges, opportunities, entitlements and benefits are or are not accrued. Rodiger reminds us that white supremacy remains at the center of American culture, shaping democracy, migration and globalization in the 21st century. To combat the inequality and exploitation it generates will require new political strategies and actions. Professor Rodiger's work is imprinted in the fields of whiteness studies, race and ethnic studies, labor history studies, American studies and indigenous studies. His career spans several decades in which he has produced over 10 mon monographs, several co-authored books, over 16 edited collections, as well as countless articles and book chapters. His ideas have influenced the fields of Native American and Indigenous studies, particularly his work conceptualising the formation of white national identity. Professor Rodiger's work shaped my thinking about the logic of white possession and the formation of white identity as a possession that has cultural and social purchase in everyone's life chances as configured through the logic of capital. I came to understand that historically white resentment and economic anxiety manifest socially when there is a perceived threat to the nation's status as a white possession. Professor Rodiger's important contribution and continuing influence of global scholarship is evidenced by citations. He has over 13,000. Further, his work has received honourable mentions and book prizes. In 1992, The Wages of Whiteness, Race and the Making of the American Working Class, won the Merle Curdy Prize for Best Book of Social History. In 2013, he was conferred with the International Labor History Association Book Award for the Production of Difference. The book Class, Race and Marxism, originally published by Verso in 27, won the CLR James Prize. Numerous invitations to present public lectures and keynote addresses from various prestigious universities in Australia, Sweden, New Zealand, South Africa, France and Britain demonstrate the global reach of his work. Rodiger has created an intellectual legacy driven by a strong com political commitment to a just future. As one reviewer of The Wages of Whiteness stated, 
Rodiga reasons that because race is a matter of culture and politics, racial oppression needs to be changed by political struggles that transform the meaning of race, especially its links to social and economic equality. In conclusion, Professor Rodiga has gifted the future a legacy. Thank you for your scholarship and commitment to making the world a better place to live. Thank you. Mm. That was really moving. Uh, so uh, I'll step into the hot seat after that. Um, it's, it's really an honor and a privilege to participate in this conversation. Um, I'm grateful to have a chance to acknowledge um, Dave's influence on the page as a mentor and as a critical reader, um, all of which have allowed me uh, to continue working in the academy. I'd like to thank, thank Scott Kurashige and Robert Warrior for the invitation to participate and everybody who's watching, uh, thanks for joining us. So my comments today will focus on uh, Dave's new book, The Sinking Middle Class uh, Political History, which was released by OR Books just this past October. So in mid-September, the Wall Street Journal published an essay by Oren Cass, who served as domestic policy director for Mitt Romney's 2012 presidential campaign and currently acts as executive director of American Compass, which bills itself as a new conservative think tank that challenges market fundamentalism. Entitled, America Needs a Conservative Labor Movement, the essay argues that labor unions can potentially advance core conservative priorities. Cass points to historical models such as the legendary organizer, those are his words, uh, Samuel Gompers, and the tradition of Cold War anti-communist unionism. He points to the Polish Solidarity Movement, which he claims finally broke the Soviet Union. The history Cass invokes would separate skilled from unskilled workers. It would exclude non-white workers and immigrants, and it would revitalize anti-communism for the new Cold War with China. Cass invokes a vision of workers collaborating with their bosses, a vision that seeks to dissipate class conflicts. Such an approach, he argues, would rectify a US labor movement that has become, in his words, reliant on public sector workers for whom bigger government was the priority. On November 5th, Cass posted a short essay on the American Compass website calling for a broad-based multi-ethnic coalition of working families. Trump, he insisted, has changed the equation, increasing his share of working class support by, according to his argument, emphasizing industrial and skilled trades jobs uh, and tying rising wages and clean air and water to US national security interests and to law and order. As Dave writes in The Sinking Middle Class, to understand the US as a middle class country inevitably draws us into an American exceptionalist mythology. Invocations of the middle class in US politics and society increased during the Cold War, emphasizing the standard of living and the apparent absence of class conflict within the US. As Dave notes, it seemed not so much capitalism, but the specific adoption of a US model of supposed free enterprise capable of generating a giant middle class that would best communism. The idea of the middle class was integrally tied to US nationalism in this period, a cornerstone of anti-communist reaction in the era of decolonization. Dave draws out the context of the Cold War and its aftermath in his analysis of the career of Stanley Greenberg, a democratic polling consultant who developed the thesis that disastrous Republican electoral victories could be fended off only by keeping demands for racial and gender justice meager, by deploying the categories middle class and white working class interchangeably. In a series of polls for Bill Clinton in 1992, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, Greenberg's polling left little room to connect the military budget and weapons manufacturing to the concerns of union members. Greenberg leveraged his contracts with the Democratic Party to build an international portfolio of corporate and political consulting. His clients have included Monsanto, British Petroleum, and Boeing. 
Dave charts out a steady rightward trajectory of Greenberg internationally, consulting for the opposition to Evo Morales in the 2002 Bolivian elections, apparently manipulating polling data in the interests of the Venezuelan opposition to Hugo Chavez, supporting drives for free trade policies across Latin America, and working on behalf of rightist politics in Israel and South Africa. Dave also invites us to understand Greenberg's thesis of the middle class in a broader historical context, drawing connections to Edward Bernstein, a leading theorist of the Second International and a member of the Social Democratic Party of Germany. Participating in social democratic debates on imperialism and foreign policy, Bernstein insisted on the progressive character of British imperialism because he argued it was marked by democratic and libertarian values. He advocated German expansion into the world market through cooperation with Great Britain, the lead imperialist country of the time. As one historian of the Second International has written, on the eve of World War I, Bernstein urged social democracy to throw its weight behind German colonial policy. Reading Dave's analysis of the concept of the middle class in recent US politics calls to mind the concept of the aristocracy of labor. In his analysis of imperialism, Lenin described a section of the working class within imperialist countries, which had been captured by bourgeois consciousness, receiving material dividends for its role in sustaining bourgeois power. While super exploitation in the colonies paid for the relative privileges of the labor aristocracy, it also exacerbated divisions within the metropolitan working class, driving down the standard of living for many workers while elevating leaders who increasingly identified with bourgeois values and lifestyles while claiming to speak on behalf of the working class. In the imperialist core, the labor aristocracy is a primary tool for dividing the working class. Capitalism in the imperialist era offers no solutions to its inherent and internal tendencies towards crisis other than the intensification of the crisis itself. As we're seeing since the onset of the pandemic, the, the pandemic, the, in, the, uh, the instability arising from intensified crisis serves to enhance the profits of the largest financial interests. The aristocracy of labor is an attempt to soften these tendencies towards parasitism and decay within the imperialist core. Dave discusses the toll of middle-class identities bound together by misery. Uh, his, his, he, is, he has his phrase, a plight as well as a perch, which I think is a really, um, you know, it, to me, it speaks really powerfully. Um, these middle-class identities are marked by feelings of glum solidarity, even bitterness. He writes that the miserable feeling of having fallen or never risen, as much as the fear of falling, defines middle-class life. Speed up, overwork, debt, anxiety, and depression shape middle-class identities in the U.S. They also shape the character of U.S. nationalism written in a middle-class image. In the mass psychology of fascism, Wilhelm Reich examined changes in German working-class culture which had accepted the conventions and views of the bourgeois layers of society. Reich wrote that the industrial workers of England, America, Scandinavia, Germany are becoming more and more bourgeois. To understand how fascism infiltrates the working classes, this process has to be traced. Writing in the early 1970s, Mikhail Kalecki referred to the social movements of the far right that backed Barry Goldwater's 1964 presidential campaign as the fascism of our time. Kalecki urged that we should study these as decades long projects to capture state power and remake society. We can see the evidence of their success here in the US as well as in Brazil, in India and in other places. The division of the working class today strengthens the momentum of this project of the far right. Oren Cass proposes a conservative labor movement against the teachers, nurses, postal workers, flight attendants, public employees, and immigrants, all of which are majority women and non-white workforces, which have formed the core of the revitalized US labor movement, engaging in strike actions that have tipped from economic to political demands. The Poor People's Campaign has found that more than 40,600,000 people live below the poverty line in the US, and that close to 140 million people 
which is 43.5% of the population in this country, are either poor or low income. They found that nearly half of the US population cannot afford a $400 emergency. The sinking middle class can help us understand how middle class ideology obfuscates the realities of the US and its place within the larger world. The political focus on the assumption of the middle class diverts energy from the crucial question of how to unify the working class across its manifold social divisions. We ignore these truths and the questions they raise at our grave peril. The sinking middle class, like Dave's body of work overall, can help equip us with historical and theoretical tools to engage this vital work of building unity among the more, within and among the North American working class. So I wanna say thanks to Dave for this work and thank you all for listening. Okay, um, can everybody hear me? I am gonna read uh, from my computer screen. So hopefully that won't be too distracting for you. Um, so when I'm thinking through some political question after being entranced by what David Rodiger describes in the sinking middle class as the attention sucking world of the electoral news cycle and its sound bites, I sometimes write an email to Dave to run something by him or ask a question. The best responses I get are challenging, suggesting that my own thinking, uh, my own tendency to find a pragmatic solution to an immediate problem has gotten the best of my ability to dream better and fight harder as Dave advocates at the end of the book. I find this happens more than I'm comfortable with, despite my having been deeply influenced by Dave's ideas since I studied with him at the University of Minnesota in the 1990s, and even as I continue to read and teach his work. In fact, I have been so deeply influenced, but, but before I go on, I'd like to note with deference to Rodiger's own investment in surrealism that I once gave a detailed lecture on the wages of whiteness at Edmund Morgan's American Slavery, American Freedom in a Dream. It was during a period when I was teaching five classes a semester. So I had repeated the narrative three times that week and the difference between sleeping and waking may not have been entirely clear, but I did get the date of Bacon's Rebellion right. Talking about Dave's work in my sleep to a wide awake imaginary assembly of students resembled another moment in my previous life as a pastry cook when I woke up from a nap on a beach in Long Island on my one day off, convinced I had to get a pie out of the oven. Certainly it's better to dream about abolishing uh, whiteness than to mull over uh, making pies for rich summer people in Long Island. So whether I understand these dreams in a materialist way or in a psychic way, I credit Dave on both levels for helping me to dream better. To be more serious and beyond uh, Dave's influence as a mentor for me personally, what I appreciate most about Rodiger's work is the consistent refusal to fall into familiar grooves of much post new left political writing as he continues to push both his own thinking and the boundaries of the possible beyond the terms laid out by the overly electorally focused commentariat. So I title my comments beyond the merely possible to talk about the visionary aspects of Dave's work even though this might be easy to miss given his emphasis on tragedy and misery in United States history. And even as we experience misery in our day-to-day -day lives, we are often pressured to deceive ourselves with a habitual cruel optimism and Rodiger's work helps us understand these deceptions and reject them in order to enable a more genuinely visionary conception of the future. One of my memories of being puzzled by Dave as a student was an interaction I had with him on an office hours visit I found him sitting in a darkening room as the sun went down. He hadn't turned the lights on. And when I offered to flip, flip the switch by the door, he joked that working in the twilight gloom helped him appropriate, be more appropriately depressed about the subject he was thinking about. I didn't know what he was writing about the time, but since then I imagine he may have been referring to the kind of problematic optimism that I once heard him describe in a talk in the early 2000s. As he put it, there was, according to survey-based social science research, uh, at the time, the claim coming out in the 1990s and early 2000s that, quote, whites were getting better all the time. By 20, 2016 and by our recent uh, re, um, election in 2020, those uh, predictions, those hopeful predictions about the end of race thinking have been uh, completely dashed horribly. And over the last four years, there has been much to be miserable about. Rodiger described our moment in bleak terms in his 2019 essay, White Privilege, White Advantage, and Human Misery on the Verso blog. 
his, the essay concludes, we have little chance of winning whites from the far-fetched ideas that they are made miserable by people of color or from the false hope that they can pursue happiness through white identity if we do not allow that they are unspeakably sad and increasingly desperate. We will soon reach a limiting case in that regard. If all goes as planned, the planet will shortly lose its ability to nurture the forms and number of living things it now sustains. To the considerable extent that they have more wealth, average whites will presumably have more access to the planet's last fish, to increasingly scarce food in general, to the fossil fuels that helped broil the planet that will provide power to cool a few a little longer, and to habitats not flooded or on fire. Advantages will vary by class, but absent white, but absent change, white advantage will be real. Such advantages will provide a few months of additional misery to the advantaged and perhaps even years to the truly advantaged, a longer window to watch the catastrophes from gated climate controlled havens until those too fail. But as the sinking middle class demonstrates, it's also possible to be wrong by being too pessimistic, casting too jaundiced an eye. Going back even to Stanley Greenberg in Macomb, a certain type of pessimistic assessment of the white working class or middle class simultaneously also allows them to mon monopolize our attention and has been central to the limiting scope of political limiting the scope of political demands to what is understood to be politically savvy. And so even at his most pessimistic, Rodiger's work doesn't treat race as something static, uh, but describes both race and class as formations, as processes, not things. This is not about conflating skin or family background with the limits of consciousness. He found, finds hope through the argument that the lived experience of white privilege or as in sinking, living the American dream is best understood as actually miserable. This doesn't mean as Rodiger explained in How Race Survived US History, that we should take up the implausible complaints of aggrieved colonials of the 18th century who erased the experiences of the enslaved to highlight their own travails with the British empire. Uh, not to mistake that for a real reckoning with the misery of whiteness. Nonetheless, Rodiger also argues that Samuel Johnson's counter-revolutionary cynicism misses as much as it captures. So for among the revolutionary generation, uh, there really was a contagion of liberty that led to radical interpretations of the revolution as also requiring abolitionist activism. It can be painful to consider such lessons uh, as, as hopeful moments fall, uh, including in the end of Rodiger's book, um, on post-reconstruction America seizing freedom, which describes both the grand moment of post-Civil War jubilee and the failure to build a coalition between feminists, anti-slavery activists, and labor activists during reconstruction, and the historical examples of destructive decisions, deepening conflicts, and these decisions that permitted little backpedaling from division. These questions are urgent today, for as Rodiger notes that both demands for black male suffrage and women's suffrage had been impossible in 1864, one might ask the same question about two impossible demands currently battling each other on Twitter, whether Medicare for all requires the abandonment of the demand to defund the police. Uh, it might also hurt a little to think about something better. As psychoanalysis can demonstrate, the defenses we build against experiencing misery keep us from imagining what it would look like to live differently and more freely. Defenses may feel comfortable and possibly even terrifying to let go unless we recognize that the defenses themselves are what makes us miserable. At the same time, things that are actually desirable by seeming unfamiliar or even impossible may first appear quite threatening because of the danger they present to the defenses we've grown so used to. Rodiger's work tells us not to accept that set of conditions as permanent. That is, rather than being motivated by guilt into giving up something so that others can have more, Sinking is another piece in a long argument that jumps past familiar polarized conversations about US politics to argue that what white people have to lose is yes, real privilege in the short term, but always with the recognition that the privilege itself is a set of chains, binding us both psychically and politically. Rather than being shame stricken into pretending race into invisibility, it would be good for everyone to combat the limits of race thinking for ourselves and our politics. It is a credit not only to surrealism and psychoanalysis, but also always to James Baldwin as much as to Marx, that Rodiger continues to remind us that until we recognize that we have mistaken familiar misery for comfort, that even the left wing of the possible will remain a sad compromise, allowing us to carve out a tiny space to protect from the encroaching misery, a tide that does not lift but ultimately sinks in the negative sense, all votes. 
So while Du Bois is a core influence and touchstone in all Rodiger's work, going back to the psychological wage, wage described in Black Reconstruction, thinking implicitly continues to draw much from Baldwin, whose writings on whiteness I first encountered in Dave's collection of essays toward the abolition of white, whiteness. That book opens with the epigraph, as long as you think you're white, there's no hope for you. The key to the comment is not to create the ultimate in white guilt. Uh, the problem is that race thinking makes an identification with skin seem like something worth hanging on to. In the same essay on privilege, advantage, and misery from Verso in 2019, Rodiger comes back to Baldwin again. The burden of Baldwin's The Price of the Ticket is precisely that the inhumanity of whiteness is double. It has worked to meet out misery across the color line and to pave the way for whites themselves to accept misery as the best of all possible worlds. Because it is infused with this insight, I also find that Rodiger's work inspires less student defensiveness than some other works on race do as as they read about uh, in race, how race survived US history, which I've just taught recently, uh, they understand race as a process, not an ens essence, and understand and encounter flawed, limited historical subjects, sometimes acting heroically and often failing tragically. I also think it acknowledges Rodiger's own understanding of social movements and demonstrates that he is right to reject any call to tamp down social protest for the sake of electoral victory. To point out that my students this term coming from a summer of protests, seem to have already embraced much of the substance of how race survived without having read it. So whatever happens next, it would be short-sighted to regret these protests on account of pro-Trump voters in the various newly amplified Macomb counties of post-electoral analysis. Instead, as Rodiger advises, we have to continually, quote, remind ourselves that there are arenas of struggle and visions of what is possible other than electoral ones. These struggles do not mean that a vision is easily achieved achievable or that we don't face real danger, but it is also the case that impossible struggles have been won in the past and that victories may come to us through unexpected and from unexpected directions. And so uh, I will stop there and let the next person go. Um, am I next, Scott? Okay, all right. Um, well, first, I just want to apologize. Uh, had a qualifying exam oral defense that ran um, much longer than I anticipated. So I'm um, sorry to show up a little late. I do want to thank uh, both Scott and uh, Robert Warrior for the invitation to participate in this uh, tribute and reflection on Dave Rodiger's work, as well as uh, to thank Dave for uh, participating and um, I, I've, I've met Dave Rodiger um, a couple of years before the Wages of Whiteness appeared. I was a undergraduate at the University of Missouri Columbia. He was a very uh, lean athletic uh, young professor who had a really big beard and always had a tennis racket in his hand every time I saw him. <laughs> Um, and, and unfortunately, because I uh, didn't plan that well, I'm unable to, to unearth any of the photos of, of him in, in this state. But um, he's been someone who's been very supportive and encouraging me um, since that time uh, at the University of Missouri. And I remember specifically um, the context in which I, I encountered Dave, I think is important. And that um, as a black student from and, and from a, a poor working class background, um, no one that I knew had gone to college. And so getting to uh, the University of Missouri and hearing people talk about um, a course on slavery with this white professor and a number of us just raised that eyebrow skepticism about taking a class on black people with um, white professors. And, everyone's response who had had the class was, but he's not really white. And that was one of those things that, you know, we, we kind of said when basically you could trust that the person wasn't gonna be racist in some way, um, that was kind of our bare minimum. And so I ended up taking a summer class with Dave and it was one of the best summer classes, one of the best classes I'd had. Um, I didn't know what to expect and then had a couple of conversations. And these were actually offered through the history department, but also tied to black studies. I was a black studies minor. Um, 
and had a couple of conversations. And he gave me two books to read over the summer as a way to figure out if, what I really wanted to do. And I thought, okay, these are gonna be you know, small books. It's the summer, I'm relaxing. And it gives me George Rawwick's uh, From Sundown to Sunup and then Sterling Stuckey's Slave Culture. And he's like, yeah, read these and give me a book review of them next week. <laughs> In the month that it took for me to get through Sterling Stuckey's <laughs> slave culture, um, it really did transform how I thought about uh, both Black studies and doing history. Um, and just the generosity that you uh, kind of walked me through that process. I really appreciate it. I still remember it very vividly to this day. And I still have my copy of um, Slave Culture um, to this day. Um, but one of the things I, I, I wanted to kind of talk about was the um, impact of wages of whiteness on my thinking about race and politics and how I see it kind of reappearing in the sinking middle class. Um, and I'm just early on in the introduction, um, Dave makes this point. The, stir, the story of the great modern democratic, con, debt, capital D, democratic conjuring trick of making the unspecified but clearly white middle class define the limits of possibility along austere neoliberal lines, thus allows us to consider how the media and the candidates make such class terminology both a series of platitudes and a seemingly exciting end insiders are got underpinning liberal warnings against going too far. Um, and I see this for me at least uh, kind of reflecting the, the, the impact that wages of whiteness had on me um, in undergrad uh, in a number of ways. But in particular, I was, this was right at the point where the, the idea of someone identifying as biracial or multiracial was, just gaining traction in popular conversations. And I was intrigued by this in part because I didn't understand it. I have a white father, but no relationship with him or any kind of white community. And so I didn't understand what it meant for someone to say that they were part white or that they were white and black. Um, but this was more so just intuitive. I didn't really have anything to, any meat to put to the bone as it were. But reading The Wages of Whiteness, even though it was exceptionally dense and I didn't get everything at the, the first reading, one of the things that did kind of came, come out to me and then in subsequent, subsequent conversations and reading Dave's work since then um, was a question around what does it mean when one is claiming whiteness? And not this question of ancestry, but really what is at play in the claim to power and the proximity to power that one is making. And for me, it became a question of um, how this relates to the degree to which one is distancing themselves from Blackness. And in particular, for those people who have traditionally in the US context been defined as Black, how does that move allow for a distancing from Blackness and then gaining what he was calling the wages of whiteness or some element of those wages, those rights, privileges, protections that one gets as a citizen of the polity, of, of the body politic. Um, and that, you know, it, it interested me for a while. I wrote a little bit about this question of uh, people who have a black and a white parent saying that they're biracial and not black and kind of the political implications of that. Um, and I ended up not pursuing that as a dissertation topic and wrote about early 20th century black radicals. And then the first book was on black radicals between um, Harlem and London. Uh, but Dave also uh, is influential in that he, along with others like Sumbiata Chaju at the University of Missouri, who was one of the first people to introduce me to CLR James, um, who I didn't really know anything about. And then uh, he was advising a student group and they came to us to, to show a documentary about James shortly after he had passed away. And, um, and so the, the both 
mentor-mentee relationship of being both Dave's student as an undergrad and then a graduate student at the University of Missouri. I mean, excuse me, at the University of Illinois. Um, and then um, just the conversations over the years about James's work, seeing his engagement with James, Du Bois, others around questions of politics, um, continue to have me think about some of the issues that I, that I grapple with today. And one of the things that um, strikes me with the sinking middle class that um, for me at least kind of spans his work is also a question that or a concern that I've had about how people talk about white working, white workers and white, the white working class voting against their own interests by voting for Republicans whose policies um, don't help the working class in, material, in a material sense and then voting for Trump. Um, and on the one hand, I understand the point that's being made about their actual material well-being, but I always found it somewhat troubling because it seemed to suggest that there is something um, immaterial about whiteness, that it's something that serves as a ruse, as a sort of false consciousness that mask the real nitty gritty of politics. Um, and so I always found myself wondering, well, in the context of white supremacy, of this current racial regime, people do actually get something tangible out of being white. And so in voting for their interests as whites, that that's something that we should not neglect. And I think that comes out in, um, in, in this sinking middle class. And so just another passage that really struck me because I'm also working on uh, some work around race and the question of the political with Cedric Robinson's work. Um, but this statement toward the end of the introduction um, where he's saying uh, that his book, The Sinking Middle Class, quote, does not pretend to strike a decisive blow against the hegemony of the electoral. It seeks to renew left critiques of the middle class as a social formation itself widely varied in class terms, as a site of misery, and as needing the presence of working class movements, including movements of working class people who also call themselves middle class to save itself. And I think we can all hear in Dave as well, a sense that that working class is not a singular working class, that these are a range of peoples and communities that make it up. And so what the working class is, isn't simply given. This is something that is uh, deeply divided and possibly um, in some ways contentious within itself. And this brings up this question of um, how we understand the wages of whiteness and how we understand those stakes in the context of thinking about a sinking middle class whose focus is largely on electoral politics. But if we kind of follow uh, Dave's suggestion that this sets the limit of what we see as possible, um, how this is talked, how does it talk about, how it's framed, I would want to suggest that one of the ways we can think about those wages is that they, they arise within the context of the political. They arise within the context of a realm that is seen as inherently contentious. It's always a contest over resources, or it's a, it's a realm of antagonism, um, or to use the, the famous Nazi Carl Schmitt, this is the realm of conflict between friend and foe. And I, and I wanna suggest that what I find and what I think is suggestive about Dave's work and um, is, is there as well in, in the sinking middle class, is to call into question this realm of conflict. Not that we disengage from it, but that we understand its limitations. And that if we are to realize real possibilities, that involves not only getting beyond whiteness and calling it into question and seeing how it operates in a range of ways, but also calling into question the realm that it emerges in. And in that way, I think there's a, a way to see um, the political and whiteness and racial regimes as indelibly tied to one another. And that that becomes a productive point to begin to think about what possibilities could there be beyond electoral uh, liberal democratic norms uh, are the modern present. Um, so thank you, I'll leave it there.
Okay, thank you all. Um, I feel like I'm both exhausted with Zoom and just really excited to be with so many of you here today because the ASA is such a special place that I'd actually rather have a virtual ASA than none at all. And that must have been like in my subconscious because I just noticed as I was about to read this paper, I don't know if you can see it. And actually I wrote at the top ASA Honolulu 2019. <laughs> so I'm clearly still in that space with everybody. <laughs> and the Kanaka Maui hosts uh, who welcomed us last year. Um, so I'm very delighted we can have this session because in addition um, to Dave Rodiger being a past president of the president of the ASA and a formidable scholar, he's really been a model of a generous selfless mentor as others have already spoken to um, since I first met him when I was a graduate student nearly a quarter century ago. I first came across the wages of whiteness around 1992 or 93 um, I was pursuing a master's in Asian American studies and then a PhD in history at UCLA. But my primary identity then was an activist and my theories of race were informed principally by veteran Marxist Leninist revolutionaries who saw white supremacy as the linchpin of US capitalism and thus uh, important to recognize as they were developing strategies for revolution. I was aware that a range of pamphlets and position papers by radicals like uh, Noel Ignatiev and Ted Allen had shaped the left debates of the 60s and 70s around whiteness and class formation. And I was captivated when a comrade gave me a self-published self typewritten copy of J. Sakai's Settlers, the mythology of the white proletariat. Yet I was too timid to cite these works in my seminar papers. Um, I did once bring up to one of my professors, a prominent scholar of US colonial history, that I wanted to examine the origins of white skin privilege drawing from the writings of Lerone Bennett. Before I could finish the sentence, he said, that's a terrible book. So I ultimately realized, hey, this Rodiger guy seems to have gained acceptance within the history profession. I'm gonna cite him in all my papers from now on. At the time, I wanted to put Dave's work in service of a really hardcore materialist analysis based in superstructure I felt was required to have a truly Marxist analysis of white supremacy. It was only after some years passed that I came to appreciate how Dave, much like Alexander Saxton, whose writings greatly influenced my analysis of anti-Asian violence, had advanced cultural studies of whiteness in a manner that was emblematic of American studies, a field I didn't really come across until I was an assistant professor. Skipping quickly to the present, we now have an authoritarian president tweeting baseless accounts of a stolen election while attempting a coup to stay in office. That he just got up to 75 million votes um, 85% of those votes from white people um, is a reminder of the work of hegemony whiteness continues to perform, but also a sign of how the liberal democratic order and constitution are both in crisis as the far right MAGA base shifts even further right toward QAnon. Dave's work obviously helps us sift through the gradients of white nationalism at the core of this renewed lost cause movement. At the same time, we've seen the emergence of a new left movement bringing energy and dynamism to the US political landscape and infusing it with a new sense of hope. I would argue that Dave's work is even more crucial in this context. Every generation that discovers its mission and believes that it has solved the riddle of why there is no socialism in the US ultimately bumps up against the reactionary persistence of whiteness at the heart of white workers and middle-class consciousness in America. But from the pages of Jacobin to the dramatically revitalized DSA, there's no clear sign that the newest new left has transcended this central problem or that it necessarily acknowledges its existence. The Justice Democrats aligned with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and three other progressive groups released a statement in the aftermath of the elections. It's generated a lot of attention, challenging and chastising democratic establishment leaders who they argue are holding back progress by clinging to a centrist platform and ideology. The statement asserts that Democrats would win big if they quote, connect economic justice to racial justice and quote, drive an economic message that connects with all working people. Such statements are often complemented by the certainty that Bernie would have defeated Trump by a much greater margin. I don't actually think the data from 2020 thus far supports that, even though it might seem like, uh, you know, something that we would like to be true. But more disconcertingly, while there's much to laud in uh, their work, the statement proffers that fusing race and class is the solution when the central contradiction that one must start from, as Saxon stated 50 years ago, is that race and class cut at perpendicular angles to each other. The sinking middle class continues Dave's work highlighting the challenges that must be overcome to bring white workers into a truly proletarian struggle, beginning with the regressive effects of identifying as white itself 
and also as middle rather than working class. I was especially intrigued by his analysis of how Macomb County came to emblematize the white middle class through the work of ex-Marxist turned democratic pollster and strategist Stanley Greenberg, as others have referred to. A suburban product of post-war white flight and the birthplace of the so-called Reagan Democrats, Macomb County self-consciously comprised the antithesis of urban, predominantly black Detroit, and thus it figures in my own work. Since the 1980s, it has skewed democratic when race was subordinated to an emphasis on, quote, the economy, but shifted heavily toward Trump in 2016 and slightly but significantly um, less, less towards Trump in 2020. It's about a three point difference so far in the polls. In an era of heightening polarization, such places will not be won over by progressives through either a simple change of tactics or an emphasis on what the justice Dems call, quote, an explicit multiracial populist message. Before one is ready for a war movement, what is needed is a deep protracted engagement in the war position. A difficult task to be certain, but one made more manageable and tangible by the guiding light of Dave Rodiger. Thank you. Thanks everybody who's already commented and uh, um, some, of, some of my favorite uh, things I wanted to say have already been said, which is always a, a great thing because I can say a couple of other things that I wanted to say as well. I'm really pleased to, to see the turnout. Uh, today, it's great to, to um, have this opportunity to uh, talk about Dave's work and uh, his, his influence on, on so many people in so many places. And I just want to thank, um, thank everybody for, for being a part of this, especially, especially Dave. So, so I think back to, uh, it wasn't the time when I first got to know Dave, but uh, I, the first time I asked him to do something was to respond to a panel that uh, Sharon Holland uh, and I and um, um, somebody else were on uh, back in Hartford in 2004 uh, about Afro-Native issues. And, uh, and I, I knew Dave would say something really smart and something good, but I was just blown away by the way that he was able to respond to uh, respond. It was, it was Jennifer Brody who was on it as well with us, uh, that, um, that Dave was able to respond um, more smartly than anybody I could imagine uh, to the issues that were involved in that particular in that particular um, topic uh, from our papers that were really well researched and also really offered a, a look into the future about where this discussion has gone around indigeneity, blackness, and whiteness. And uh, I, you know, and I was really just uh, um, I, I knew it. I knew then that that uh, you know Dave was somebody that even though I knew him, I wanted to get him. To, I wanted to get to know him better. Uh, just because of just the sheer intelligence of what he brings uh, uh, to his work. And, and I can tell you, I think that's why uh, he and uh, Aileen hit it off so well, is they both have just that fierce intelligence that um, when you ever see it come together, um, it, it's just something amazing to watch. Um, I later became uh, Dave's colleague at University of Illinois, and he really became a mentor, even though I didn't ask him to do that. Uh, I just I, I tell people sometimes a story of saying to Dave as we were walking over to the coffee shop near us, the Espresso Royale near us in um, uh, Champaign that uh, I said, oh my goodness, I'm working on my 10th tenure and promotion letter right now. And he said, oh man, that, that, that's really hard. That's, that, that's where I say no every year. I say, it. when I get to 10, I say no. And it was a really great mentoring moment for me because I realized that I wasn't the only person doing this many tenure and promotion letters. But then I, I realized Dave has been at this for you know, quite a bit longer than me. And that just think of how many hundreds and hundreds of tenure and promotion letters that represents. And he doesn't always do 10, but I know that uh, he, he's, he's done that many and uh, uh, figuring out how to do that, it's nice to it's nice to have somebody else who can help you figure out how to manage all of that. And 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 really, at that time, I really started thinking of Dave uh, really as a as a as an intellectual and an academic uh, comrade in the work that we try to do and to try to make the academy a different place. And that that's something that requires not just thinking but doing. It involves organizing other people and thinking about the ways that we can make specific sorts of changes in the academy. And that so much of that really, I think, comes out of the sense that that uh, Dave is a fellow laborer, and that he, he's always reminding you without being uh, pedantic about it at all, that what we're doing is work, and that, that we're in a workplace, and that, that whatever else we build within that workplace comes out, comes out of the work that we do. 
I later learned that just as I was the president of the ASA right after, right after Dave, so the year after. So we worked together pretty closely for two years. And I, you know, I just, I, I got to tell you, because most of you won't know Dave in this kind of context, that, that the way that Dave does his work is really remarkable to see the way that he just handled everything. And it was intimidating to me because I usually rely on other people to pick up, you know, where I, where I drop things and I feel like I drop them off. And I just never saw Dave drop anything that we needed to do. And I thought, well, oh, what's it going to be like working the year after, you know, this, I mean, how many things are going to be left for me to pick up that Dave has dropped? And there was nothing left that I had to do that was on, you know, that was on Dave's plate that dropped off onto mine. Uh, I also saw at that time, uh, just what a benefit it was to have somebody who had been, who had been a labor organizer, who'd been involved in that kind of politics and organizing that when we, you know, when, when Dave wrote a letter as president to ASA to, 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 uh, to somebody uh, who was a union leader, you know, he addressed them as brother. And, and if I tried that, it would sound dumb, you know, but, but Dave coming from his context wrote in the language of the people that we were speaking to. And that was so helpful uh, as we were trying to establish solidarity in that particular moment that we were able to address people in that way. And, uh, um, and, and it just uh, has always made me very much appreciate everything about Dave. Now being at the University of Kansas at the same time, uh, I also uh, benefit uh, um, uh, constantly from, from his example and his hard work. And the other things I want to say really have to do with the new book, The Sinking Middle Class. Uh, it's, a, it's a book that I want to say uh, is, I want to pretend like I'm a radio host without asking him questions about it that he gets to answer, but to, to plug the book and to tell people it's one, it's one to read right now because this election is so fresh on our minds almost everywhere in the world. People are thinking about the U.S. election, I know, at least at some level probably not as much as we think, but, but people are because it impacts people around the world, uh, what happens here. And so to have this particular book that, that brings together so many important things that really ought to be really important to us, especially about electoral politics and a critique of electoral politics is, is really crucial. Um, and um, I wanna, I'm gonna try to move just something over into over into the chat just to give a quote from it and um, see if see if everybody can see it. I think they will be able to. So yeah, this is a, a if you look over into the chat column over there, this this quotation about elections now rarely seem anything but imminent and historic. And we've all just been through that through that cycle. And part of what Dave says within this, he says we heard in 2018 that it was the most important election. Uh, of our lifetime. And then right after that, 2020 became that. And even though I tend to agree on this last one, that it was a super important election, maybe the most important one I remember in my lifetime, we can pretty much guarantee that, you know, next week, if not already, people are saying that 2022 election, that's the one that's really going to tell us what, you know, what the future of Trumpism is. And, and, and to have this critique that is so well thought out, and that is so important for us to think about, uh, because we, those of us who are scholars who are in the academy, are exactly in the class of people who are targeted to be to be put to sleep, to be put into, to be hypnotized by by the kind of electoralism that Dave critiques, and the way that that kind of electoralism, through his incredible genealogy of, of Stanley Greenberg, and going then going back before that to to the 1950s, the 1940s, and 1930s, that that the way that, that that Dave shows in the book, the way that 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 whiteness and the way that that uh, electoralism uh, and the way that the idea of the middle class come together, I think it's just a really important one, and it's the perfect time to to, to be thinking about this because it's so much on our minds, uh, and you can even see in this quotation the way that you know Dave ends it where, you know, he says, with, you know, people, some of us love to be that person that knows to be the first one to know things are happening, right? Um, even as we might critique them, uh, that, that he doesn't just, he, he doesn't sneer at anybody because he says, yeah, sometimes I, you know, maybe, maybe I, I maybe I saw that too, right? And uh, uh, that's very much the way that, that uh, uh, Dave is and the way that he operates. I wanted to, to just uh, put up one other quote um, before saying a couple of things. And um, 
this is this is also from from, from the new book. Um, if you look back further in the chat, I put a link to the OR um, books uh, website where you can where you can uh, get a copy. And this idea that that we exist within a world, especially if you're in the U.S. and you're you're sucking up the media in the way that we do, uh, many of us do, that there that this reverence for the electoral cannot change by eloquent citations, whines, nor even frontal attack. Now, this is very much, I think, a, shows an, an intellectual practice and a praxis that that Dave has participated in since uh, since. Uh, the beginning of his career that, that's very much a, um, a beacon and an example for us. He has a really nice long quotation about his own work going back to the 1970s, what he's been trying to do as part of it. And what I've always, I guess what I, what I appreciate about every, everything that I've, that I've uh, done with Dave, whether it's gaining from his work, having him read my work, uh, which is always a real thrill, uh, or just working side by side with him uh, in a department or on a campus uh, is, is this idea that in fact, being an intellectual is not in and of itself, uh, it's not in and of itself a practice that changes things, uh, that you have to find a way of doing that work that, that, be, that, that leads to meaningful change and that that means working with other people, learning from them, uh, being being part of the world that they're part of, it means organizing. Uh, it means it means saying, how do I need to get this organized? And if you're part of the ASA Council or part of the ASA Executive Committee, it might mean how can we be better organized, or how can we organize this to actually make a difference? The thing so much that I took out of out of this new book was the idea that that um, that that. I want to help people get over something that I try to get over as well. That voting is not intellectual work. Um, watching cable news is not intellectual work. It may be something to do to have on in the background as you as you go through the things that you do. Uh, but these are um, uh, that th th that it's important to to take the further step to say what is it that we're that that we can achieve. That's going to involve turning off the TV. It's going to involve turning off the internet and connecting with other people. Unless now today, that's what you have to do to connect with people uh, in order to, to start organizing to make a real difference. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for listening. I think I'm up, right? Um, Thank you, first of all, to everybody. These are um, not just respected colleagues in this panel, but good friends. And, and uh, I, it's a little hard for me to sit through the, the, <laughs> the praises. I start to wonder if people think I'm, might think I'm sick if, they, if there wasn't more, uh, <laughs> more negativity. Um, but I really do appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody uh, coming, also the people who are listening uh, on a Friday afternoon. It's quite a remarkable thing that we had good attendance. And I want to thank Scott in particular. I want to thank Emily. I want to thank the uh, ASA staff, Robert, for his uh, role. So I want to talk um, a little bit about mentoring. Um, and then I want to talk about uh, sinking middle class a little bit uh, and to go back to some of the things that were said. Um, it struck me that uh, my this the two I think students that uh, are on the panel uh, I was not the advisor for either uh, although I think I may have ended up signing Minka's paperwork in an in an emergency uh, but uh, he of course uh, studied with the great Juliet Walker and with uh, Sundiata Chajua uh, Rebecca uh, was a student of Paula Rabinowitz. Uh, and in my own case, my fabulous lifelong mentor, Sterling Stuckey, uh, was not my uh, dissertation advisor for reasons that reflect poorly on me, but kind of stuck with me um, through the long haul and uh, convinced me really that I was, as he would put it, still an African Americanist and uh, not just a labor historian, also as as uh, Sterling uh, would have put it. 
So I think that we really mentor and influence in a lot of different ways. And I thought of this particularly in Elaine's remark because um, I think she's my mentor. <laughs> and I think it's important that we have that kind of mutuality that uh, her work and the uh, Australian example, which is so challenging to all uh, US-based critical whiteness studies that you know through the years has leaned so heavily on slavery in Africa. And in Australia, you don't have uh, African slavery, and yet you end up with a whiteness that is um, recognizable as one of the terrible whitenesses of the world. It, it, it very much re resembles um, US whiteness. And so the move in my later work toward thinking about um, settler colonialism and indigeneity uh, was very much the product, not just of your work, but of being at those conferences uh, in Australia and, and, and seeing uh, work from New Zealand and Australia and, and just um, not having a response and not uh, uh, and yet being welcomed without uh, being welcomed as a learner and not uh, having to pretend to know. Uh, so there was a lot of space uh, in that relationship. And I think that that kind of capacious uh, idea of mentoring, uh, I saw a, a George Lipsitz letter uh, in which he uh, referred to, to, to me as a mentor. And I thought, my goodness, you've got to be older than I am. How could that be? And, uh, but I think it's true. I think we mentor each other, we influence uh, each other, and that the, Elaine's example is, is the perfect example of that. But on different wavelengths, I thought about it as every person. Talk Manu, for example was also a, a part of my uh, learning to learn about indigeneity in a little, I think probably three person uh, reading group. Uh, himself, Zach Sell, and I would read things, uh, indigenous uh, writings from different places in the world. And so um, I think we, we really need that. And, we, and it makes me wonder a little bit if there are times when um, I'm a better mentor of somebody that I don't advise. I think the advising relationship um, kind of enjoins a hands-on uh, professionalizing, to use that terrible word, uh, emphasis that isn't always the most useful and uh, uh, generous, generative uh, way to, to mentor and, and to influence. So I'm glad to be able to say that. The, the book, um, this book, uh, I'm glad it, it came up so strongly uh, and that while the presentations were partly about my career, they were also uh, specifically tethered to the, to the book. Um, because it's a book that, that a little bit struggles, I think, in this moment to get a hearing. It's gotten around uh, quite nicely in some ways, but it's very overshadowed by the election. And it, it's uh, a little bit ironic because the energy for it was to write a book that talked, that took electoral politics uh, seriously. Um, so for me, it was a big departure and it took me really almost a decade to, to write it, uh, partly because I knew I had plenty of time that politicians would always continue to talk about the middle class. And so there was no rush to complete it for this election or that election, but it definitely was pegged to this election. And yet it kind of, as some of the commenters argued, uh, says is a critique of electoral politics and of the reach of electoral politics uh, to the extent that we sometimes begin to think that maybe they're the only uh, important and meaningful uh, kind of politics. So then to have the book come out right before and right now, right after uh, the election, um, 
there is a sense in which urgent electoral issues suck all of the oxygen for uh, intellectual thought. And that's one point of the book, but it's also one uh, difficulty in uh, explaining why the book has a, a meaning beyond uh, the election. The other thing that was different for me about writing Sinking Middle Class um, is that it, it really set out to be a book that wasn't, uh, in quotes, about race. And um, my kids always uh, make fun of me as, as having written the same book 10 times because it's always about whiteness. It's always, and the covers always tend to be some kind of clever graphic with black and white playing black and white off against uh, each other. And so I, I was really kind of pleased in this instance that I was writing something that wasn't about race and certainly wasn't about black and white. And yet um, we, I'm not sure why this has come up. Um, and and uh, yet the book ends up being very much about race. It ends up being uh, undoubtedly a, a, a book that uh, is about whiteness yet again, uh, and is about the, the ways that the grammars of US politics uh, always have to do not just with class, but with race. So that when we talk about middle class, we're really talking about white middle class. And uh, when we talk about the white working class, as is increasingly and alarmingly the trend in electoral analysis uh, today, of course, we're, we're back to talking about whiteness and, and race. So um, I wanted to uh, also to, to uh, say thank you to, uh, to Rebecca for the remarks on surrealism. Uh, one of the big advantages in my life is that I've always been surrounded, and I hope this for all of the younger scholars out there, I've always been surrounded by people who were the smartest people in the room, the most knowledgeable people in the room, without being academics. And so the Chicago Surrealist Group was very important uh, to me for that reason. Uh, labor leaders uh, at Jerry Tucker and other labor leaders at various times who would know not just things I needed to learn about the labor movement, but would know more about literature than I did and would know more about art uh, than, than I did. So this uh, ability to be around people, Fred Thompson, the great IWW uh, historian and professor with the high school education at Work People's College in uh, Minnesota, those were people who uh, taught me uh, not only things that I benefited from knowing, but they taught me uh, that academic knowledge isn't knowledge. That's not the universe in which we ought to want to um, to deal. So um, surrealism is very important to me for that reason. And then as, as Rebecca said, and as a couple of the others uh, of you, Minka said, um, this emphasis on misery and not just on misery, but on miserableism, on a system that produces misery and produces people who learn to expect and settle for uh, misery is also very much a surrealist uh, concept. So. Maybe I'll just stop there uh, to leave us a little bit of time anyway for some Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, I just wanted to remind all the, the participants that if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read the questions from the chat. We have a couple already, but uh, go ahead and, and fire away. So the first one is a, it's a long one and it's a kind of a challenging one. I'm just gonna read it and see what, what people think. I'm wondering what the panelists think about the focus on white privilege in recent anti-racist training discourse, i.e. D'Angelo's White Fragility book. I believe Professor Rodiger's work has informed this sort of work to a degree, but I wonder about the ways such forms of neoliberal anti-racism, if I may be so disparaging, might somewhat displace the more important conversations about organizing multiracial coalitions for social justice that strive for more concrete policy changes. Not everybody at once. I, I think Dave should oh. start. It sounded like Minka might be ready to start, or was it Manu? Yeah, 
You, Dave. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I reviewed uh, White Fragility uh, at some length in Los Angeles Review of Books right when it came out. And before it would be, have been possible for anybody to know what a thing it was going to be, what a sensation uh, that it was uh, going to be. And the review was mixed. Um, I was nice to it. I think uh, that I think it, it does rest in some refracted way on critical whiteness uh, studies. Um, but I also said that it's part of a neoliberal project and that it doesn't even reflect on uh, the fact that it often is under the auspices of either reactionary university administrators or uh, corporations that these trainings uh, take place. And so we need to actually think about their context and what that does to their, to their content. Um, I think it, any such instant cure uh, for uh, racism is bound to convey some kind of falsehoods even as it conveys truths. Uh, the idea that uh, racism is personal and, and interpersonal uh, is uh, certainly true, but it's not the truth about white supremacy. And so I think that, uh, that uh, a book like White Fragility um, and the ways that white privilege is, is used, Scott mentioned that white privilege was uh, originated by Ted Allen and Noel Ignatiev, and it's very much a, a left term. And I, if nothing else, I think we should take some responsibility for it because it was developed uh, by radicals, but it's been more or less won uh, by people who uh, present it as what a South African friend of mine uh, called the sitcom version of uh, US knowledge. And that is that you can talk about any social problem uh, as terrible as it might be, addiction, alcoholism, uh, but it has to be solved in 30 minutes. And that's sort of the problem with white fragility is that you lay out this tremendous problem and then, but it can be solved in the context of a, of a day, an afternoon off of work. Um, I think now that it's become uh, such a, a, a major force, well, I don't know what to say about how to react to it now, because certainly we would want to defend white fragility against Trump, against its, its, its critics. There's a concerted attack, not just in the United States, but in other places, uh, most particularly in France now, on critical race theory. And so we would want to defend even the uh, crudest forms of uh, anti-racist education uh, against those attacks. But in the way that, uh, in the phenomenon that white fragility uh, has become, I think I wish I would have been a little bit harsher in that review. Minka or Manu, did you actually wanna speak to this? Minka, go ahead. Uh, yeah, because I, um, I haven't read White Fragility and I tend to shy away from works that suggest there's a solution that's easily had um, either in a workshop or, or by reading a book. Um, but I was just surprised when the uh, Black Lives Matter protests around George Floyd kicked off over the summer and then spread across the globe, there was a kind of um, centrist, liberal, uh, or quasi, you know, yeah, liberal, but like centrist liberal um, criticism that arose both in the Atlantic and uh, the, the group of people around that cancel culture letter that really fixated on D'Angelo and Ibram Kendi um, to, to try and show what was wrong with uh, the left, what was wrong with critical race theory um, and what was wrong with the language of white privilege. And, I, and it struck me that on the one hand, there's this longstanding tendency to, to equate white privilege with economic, economically advantaged. 
as opposed to talking about the kind of political privileges that it gets and, and the ways that, you know, uh, someone enjoys white privilege, they don't have to explain themselves in a store versus someone who doesn't have the privilege of being assumed a legitimate customer and thus being policed. So it, it just struck me that, that, that it came up as something to, to take down um, right around the moment when people were talking about the various ways that black people are killed by the police wantonly without justification. Um, and that it, that the, the killing and the spectacle of the killing and how it's trans, how it has, how it's uh, conveyed around the world, those aren't the critical issues. The critical issue is someone talking about white privilege and someone talking about, um, albeit an ill-conceived way, but a possible way of, of addressing this problem. I just, to me, that struck me as kind of the height of the problem with liberalism, uh, and particularly in the contemporary moment. And even to the point where people in that group, I followed them on Twitter. Luckily I've stopped. I, I've kind of given up that obsession, but they were so focused on how this was turning away white voters who would otherwise be allies in voting against Trump. And so I just think it kind of, the, 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 the point that the question seems to be getting at amplifies the very problem with so much of what the sinking middle class is trying to get at, uh, both with the problem of, of electoral politics and, and how race factors into that. So this question has struck a chord. We have a cue. Manu, did you want to say something? And if that's, you do not. Okay, but uh, next is Scott and then Rebecca. So we've got the chat that I can I can organize our panelists with too. No, go ahead, Rebecca. I'll go after you. Um, I, I had the benefit of reading uh, White Fragility because um, Dave passed along a facilitation task to me um, for a group of friends who were reading the book um, in a book club. Uh, and so I, I guess I would address the question about that I don't really see it as being an either or or not necessarily needing to be an either or thing about multiracial movements and projects like this kind of anti-racist education that works with individuals. Because when you work in multiracial coalitions, things happen that cause people that, that cause explosions and that cause, cause groups to fall apart around racial dynamics in the group, inside the group. And if you're gonna have multiracial coalitions, you have to be able to address that. And some of that stuff happens at the level of the individual. And I think some of the kinds of writing that we see, popular writing that comes out of, you know, critiquing social movements. Like I think about um, Assad Hader's book, um, Mistaken Identity opens with this vignette of, you know, conflict that happened in student organizations. And there has to be a place where those, con those things can be dealt with. I mean, there's so many examples, you know, think about SNCC in, in 64 in Mississippi and all the conflicts. The, the movements can rise and fall on dynamics that happen internally. So, so I don't think that these things can really be separated out so neatly. I actually do use the concept of white fragility. I think it's actually useful in certain contexts. I mean, I think it's not surprising that she came out of ac an academic context, right? Because I think we see this, this, we've seen this so many times, how people who claim to be very liberal or progressive or even left, you know, when, they're, when their sense of privilege or when structural racism, you know, is challenged, um, tend to get very, very defensive and react in a very hostile, retaliatory way. I think that, that's very common. So I think it's very useful in that context. I think where it gets misused is in uh, is, is not so much, you know, maybe or maybe it's not all the authors themselves, but how it gets sort of uh, incorporated into this broader, broader context, right? And I'm thinking you know, back to how David Brian Davis wrote The Problem of Slavery, right? And then to talk about how, you know, it was, slavery was finally abolished, but then wrote the follow-up book, I guess, The Problem of Anti-Slavery, right? Um, and I never really finished that one <laughs> because it's too much going on in graduate school at the time, as I was saying, I was more of an activist. But I feel like I want to go back to those because 
really what we have now is not so much the problem of racism and anti-racism. We have the problem of anti-racism, or as Vijay Prashad once said, the problem is not the color line. The problem is the problem of the 21st century is the problem of the color blind, right? What we have, Ibram X. Kendi says, the heartbeat of racism is denial, right? So if, ever, if everyone is on anti race or even Trump says, you know, I'm the least racist person you'll ever meet, right? The problem is people denying that there were ever even denial about racism. And I think that really does help us understand because I mean, politics at the presidential level is, is, is the analysis is very superficial, right? And I think the, the reason Obama could get more votes than Hillary is because Obama made a very clear deal with white voters. He said, if you vote for me, you are, you are upholding the idea of American exceptionalism that we, are, that we can overcome racism. We're not a racist country, right? He really very much played up that politics of, of recognition and respectability. And you can say, you can either judge whether that, that is effective and easy to or you can just say there's something you know, fatally flawed with that approach and that's why you end up um, with, with, with Trump after that. Um, but I think that's what you have. You have, you know, aside from this very, very far right group of you know, overt white supremacists, even the far right, right in this country, you know, the, the bright Fox News people, they don't see themselves as racist, right? They still see themselves as a right-wing version of anti-racism. And then, you know, the liberals see themselves as anti-racist. And so they, they, they're the ones that can handle, you know, bringing up, I mean, the liberals are the ones that, that give us the diversity industry, right, in, in academia, where you have all these flowery statements that we're so for it, right? Um, and yet when the substance uh, um, um, is really needed to transform these, these spaces, um, that's where it's always everything swept into it. So I, I, I do think this actually does help us to explain a lot that we really need to get in the mindset of thinking about the contradictions of anti-racism now, um, rather than the contradiction between just racism and anti-racism. The next question that, that I want to turn to you is, um, thank you, listening from Australia and conscious of the intersection of Aileen and David's work, could you please speak further on the value and challenges of comparative research on whiteness, settler colonialism, and indigeneity? Unmute. Um, mm. not a not a not a, a, a simple question really. Um, I think that um, if I can speak from what I see are the differences um, in the way in which race is kind of the way in which race is constructed in Australia, um, you know has its origins in the way in which um, indigeneity or uh, was also socially constructed through the prism of race. And, I, and, and it seems to me that um, Australia deals, has always dealt with the race issue um, through legislation and policy. So we, we sort of had, don't have the same kind of therapeutic um, anti-racism uh, that America has. Um, we, uh, you know, we follow that more British line whereby um, we, you know, people in Australia still feel it's really shameful to talk about being in therapy, you know. And, you know, there's this kind of sense in which, you um, there's a you know British stiff upper lip about anything and race, race, race kind of uh, you know over time um, is 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 always reduced to the interpersonal within Australia, always. Uh, there's even a denial that you know racism really exists. The Black Lives Matter really uh, put things squarely, um, I think, in the face of white Australian ways in which. Um, hasn't been done for some time, but it actually took white Australia to react to Black Lives Matter in the States, despite the fact that our incarceration and deaths in custody are, I think, you know, in terms of uh, per, if we do a population parity where ours is greater, 
but of course all of that is hidden in Australia because race is not seen as something that organises um, so, you know, the very social organisation of, of the country. I think in America, what, when I read the literature, um, and I've, I've said this before, that I think that the whiteness literature has left out um, dispossession and Native Americans in the formation of the racial state. And my, like my work, um, and I think I want to just comment on the white fragility, is that a lot of, a lot of the whiteness literature or the anti-racist literature, with its tendency to focus on the subject, does miss the actual structural um, uh, and the conditions that actually produce um, racism. So when we, you know, like, so white fragility can, is, is this kind of like quick fix about if we just get white people, to, white people to understand their fragility and that they need to overcome it and don't be so defensive, um, that that somehow is going to erase a number of centuries of the way in which racism has, uh, you know, formed, morphologised over time. Yeah, I probably, rave, I'm just ranting, I guess, because I'm, <laughs> trying to work out how best to answer a question that I really can't answer in five minutes. Um, uh, it, you know, the complexity of the differences between the way in which race operates in, in America and the way in which it operates in Australia um, is, is really yet to be, like, I think, uh, unpacked properly in the Australian context. Um, the and, and for me, America has been insightful uh, in terms of my work because it um, allowed me to see the way in which race belonged to African Americans and cult culture belonged to Native Americans, and the way in which that that separation, I guess, in the literature itself, um, didn't 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 actually address the complexity of the relationship between dispossession and savory and the formation of the racial state, um, which I can understand more in the Australian context, I guess. So I, you know, so I do think that the way that race plays out or is socially constructed in America is, is, um, is in some ways, I think, far more complex than it is in the Australian situation. Um, so that the uh, you know settler and I you know I have problem with the idea of what you know the concept of settler colonialism itself. But anyway, I'm not going to go into that here. But I think that there yeah it's it's problematic, <laughs> and um, and Australia's continual um, you know posturing to race through legislation and policy. Um, will certainly regulate and surveil it, but it won't do anything to change it in, in the Australian context. So, you know, how do we address anti-racism when the laws are racist, when the way in which knowledge is produced through race? Like there are, there are, there are more kind of epistemological and ontological issues around the formation of race than um, just the politics of it or the intersubjective relations or the, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm more thinking as I'm getting older about trying to work out how, um, how racialized knowledge is not about race, but really about the production of, of knowledge as itself. You know, so, um, because I've always been, particularly perplexed by the idea that, um, you know, in the formation of the way in which we produce knowledge and particularly since the enlightenment, um, how that notion of categorization, differentiation and separation fundamentally creates particular kind of logics that at one sense seemingly produces race, but is actually racialized in the production of race race so i anyway good morning australia
Dave, do you want to weigh in on this question? You're muted. I guess um, one of the things that matters for me is that we not just have comparisons in which the United States is the touchstone of everything. Uh, I've been doing quite a bit of work in and with South African writers and Southern Africa writers on whiteness. And uh, in some ways, it seems to me that a, a, a meeting uh, between and among Southern Africans and uh, Australian and New Zealand scholars would be more generative than to uh, have it be about how does this compare to the to the U.S. Um, I think France needs to be in these uh, conversations in a in a very full and and uh, troubled troubling way. Uh, now, Satnam Verdi's uh, work on uh, whiteness uh, and uh, migration in uh, the UK, I think is really, really important. And it's not comparative particularly, I mean, it's well read in literatures from all over the world, but it's, it, to me, reading it uh, wasn't because it knew about the United States, but because it was completely different from the United States and that we've, uh, we need to be able to, um, to take that on. And I think NISA has done that to some extent. It's one of the more fully global uh, uh, conferences that, that we have. Um, so, um, but I, I, I think we really need the broadest possible uh, conversation and to at least ask the question of how this applies beyond the Anglosphere and to think about Germany and to think about France and some of the other Netherlands uh, places uh, if we're going to have comparative study. I just wanted to, uh, the questioner's own work uh, uh, and Donis's work is uh, a fabulous example of uh, the fact that it benefits so much from being around critical race scholars and conferences in Australia. And it's, it's, uh, it's the history of Greek uh, immigrants to Australia and uh, and their relationship with whiteness. And it's just so much more uh, uh, sophisticated than uh, we've managed in the United States yet, where the kind of big ideas about whiteness are, are very much at issue, but we haven't had a forum for the real careful studies of particular things uh, necessarily. So I'll stop there. Do any other panelists want to weigh in on this question? Okay, we'll jump to a new one then. Um, it's great to see Dave and all of you. I have a similar question to the first question about a book. What are your thoughts on Isabel Wilkerson's cast? Is this progress or is it as one scholar says, quote, a one woman quest to return history historiography to the 1950s, unquote. Wilkerson is undeniably a great writer and researcher, but by developing theories innocent of conversation of scholars, she seems to be reinventing a broken wheel, in this case, comparative history rather than transnational history. Any takers on that question? I can just say that I haven't read Cast, um, although I look at it every day on my table. <laughs> Anybody else? I have a lot of books like that. I bet we all do. Yeah, I haven't read it either, but I've heard um, a lot of, there's been a lot of conversation about it. And in part, it's the, um, there, there's a, I've heard people talk about the way that uh, Wilkerson kind of dismissively deals with Oliver Cox and his work on, uh, in race casting class and um, how it flattens the complexity of race and how it doesn't map on easily to uh, a notion of caste. And um, there was a discussion yesterday that Haymarket did uh, and uh, Robin Kelly made a point that I think kind of goes to this question of transnational history, which um, was that in, in her telling of uh, caste in the US and its relation to fascism, um, that it also kind of glosses over or, or covers up Germany's own colonial past and its genocidal practices with the Nama and 
and hero people. So um, I, I've I've heard a lot of things from other academics and activists, intellectuals, and they've not been terribly uh, suggestive of the book. But I don't know if um, there's something that is actually redeeming about it. So let me just get back. I, um, could I? Yes, please. I, I, I also can't comment on um, <laughs> Wilkerson's book. Um, but I think the question for me raises a, a question that has been in my mind, and I think it comes up in the discussion about not just comparative, but relational ways of thinking about whiteness internationally and political projects that we can say could be connected to whiteness or two forms of, um, I don't know what the right, way to right way to put this but you know if we think of caste you know there's i think something really concrete for us to to look at uh the history of brahmanism in in india uh and the organizational forms of that of that history uh both in india and in the, in, in the diaspora and the ways that they've interacted with other forms of far-right politics um including uh, whiteness, uh, let's say, and in, in thought through in a capacious way. Another site that comes to mind to me, I mean, we, I know we're all talking about the U.S. election, but I think probably internationally the most moving news of the week is the return of Evo Morales uh, to Bolivia and the undoing of horribly uh, violent, uh, racist, uh, far-right coup regime in that country. Um, and, you know, just hearing some of the conversation, the discussion, there are these images that are in my mind from a lot of the rallies, the, let's say the far right rallies um, in the United States, going back to um, uh, the really kind of violent mobs outside of the Venezuelan embassy when there were uh, embassy protectors inside there. And you see these t-shirts that people have uh, and they reappear in that instance. And then sometimes in Trump rallies, you see t-shirts of people uh, wearing these t-shirts saying Pinochet was right. Or you see t-shirts of these like, I don't know what the right, like Lego figurines, like throwing Lego figurines out of helicopters. Uh, there's deep legacies. Or if we think about a Polish immigrant in South Africa murdering Chris Hani, um, there's deep legacies to the ways that whiteness, and it's broader than whiteness. These organizational forms of reactionary far-right politics have been have been operating and entrenching themselves in different countries, in different nation state formations, whether that inter interacting with each other as well. So I, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't speak to Wilkerson's text, but I think the question of caste um, to me raises this question of Brahminism. And if we're opposing, let's say the, the, the rise of this very, um, you know, this, this far right uh, that's steeped in, in misery uh, in the US, what's the relationship of that to, to other parts of the world? Thank you. So we have a few minutes left, but we don't have any questions in the chat. Uh, I want to ask any of the if any of the panelists have any questions that have come up as a result of the, of the discussion or through the comments themselves that they want to raise or pose or or further comments. That gives the audience another minute to put a question in the chat if they have one. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, I want to ask this question to Dave, and it does come up in the sinking middle class, but I want him to basically elaborate. So especially since you're now in Kansas, right? Uh, connecting sort of what's happening with these electoral discussions, but looking at it from a broader perspective, right? So there's the Thomas Frank, what's the matter with Kansas argument, which, you know, to have it stand in for a lot of things is that basically, you know, the Democrats have fallen for this culture war, identity politics, right? Uh, uh, debate, which benefits the right wing and the Republicans because um, of who votes and you know how the uh, electorate favors white and rural, rural states. Um, and I'm just wondering your thoughts. On, so it's really easy to just simply just say, well, that's not an accurate understanding of history, right? Because it's what we've been dedicated right. to right. For, for our careers. Um, but the question, I guess, is, um, um, you know, is he right? Are they generally right? And Ada Freed has a sort of black left version of this same argument, right? Um, and, you know, Todd Gitlin's been arguing this for, you know, whatever, since whatever the split in SDS occurred. Um, so, um, you know, how do you see it? I mean, do you see it as 
right or wrong historically? Do you see it right or wrong tactically? Um, and then how do you look at it strategically? I'm just curious to know, especially since you're actually in Kansas, you can give us a view from the state itself. Well, I don't purport to speak for Kansas. Uh, I'd be very unelected if that were pretending to, to, uh, to do that. Um, Frank's uh, writing on the election and I think he's back living in Kansas, is uh, pretty good and uh, very much gets past the narrowness that you described that uh, the kind of uh, one explanation fits all quality of what's the matter uh, with Kansas, the culture wars uh, explanation. But the one thing that um, I, sometimes you write a book and then you really only realize what it would mean after it's out and I think that it, there is a way in which the section on Greenberg in this book and the section on the kind of Clinton move of the uh, Democrats to the, to the center right uh, from a also barely center position to begin with, but the, the further rightward movement of the, of the Democratic Party. Um, I, I think that for me, that uh, move has given a kind of gravity to um, a class first, however, sorry, uh, a class first position inside the Democratic Party. And that therefore, uh, people like Adolf Reed, and maybe you like Frank in the, in the first instance and like Tere Reed and, and uh, some, some others, um, I think that they're a little closer to that center right wing of the party in where they draw their political energy and legitimacy from than they might like to, to think. One of the things that happens in the Greenberg episode in the book is that he's gone to Macomb County and he's coaching Clinton and he's kind of, how do you get these white Reagan Democrats or white Kansans uh, to vote as they would put it for their own interests. Um, and uh, he, he, Greenberg, coaches uh, Clinton to go confront Jesse Jackson about Sister Soldier. And uh, Clinton uh, then goes and makes this scene at a Jackson event and berates not only Sister Soldier, but uh, uh, berates Jackson for, for hosting her. Uh, this is right after the LA rebellion. And she said that she understands why there might be attacks on whites uh, as part of the uh, LA rebellion. And Jackson's response is, um, he was speaking to somebody, he, Clinton, seemed to be speaking to someone who wasn't in that room. He wasn't a push member, wasn't a Rainbow Coalition person. And uh, it's exactly right. He was uh, coached by Greenberg. He was meant to, to, uh, to speak uh, to Macomb County through berating Sister Soldier. So he wasn't speaking to somebody in that room. Well, Reed's position at that time was to go after the Rainbow Coalition. And you know, that is a serious position and you, know, you, you could take it, but in taking it, you're seriously um, aligning yourself are uh, forgetting to criticize uh, Clintonism to that same extent. So I think that one of the things that when we, uh, when DSAers believe, well, there's still something in the Democratic Party uh, that's ready there to address these class issues that they want to, to raise, or even to address racial justice issues that they uh, want to, to raise. They're seeing this rhetoric about class, mostly middle class, but sometimes white working class. And I think it functions uh, as a kind of a legitimating force for the Democratic Party of, among radicals, because it's still a party that talks about going to the people, that talks about, that parades uh, a plumber uh, or a, a, a manual worker often not even a, a union member, but a, a, a entrepreneur, uh, a self-employed person. But it, it, so what I would wanna say is that um, 
if Frank and Reed and others uh, are going to trade on an attack on identity politics as the key to all of the failures of the liberal left, um, they really need to, to say more about their relationship to white identity politics of the sort that's practiced by Greenberg and that pushed the and that actually successfully reshaped the Democratic Party in the way that Jackson didn't so far reshape the, the Democratic Party. So I, 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 would, I, would, I would say that. Time for maybe one more, if there is any, anyone who wants to win. Robert, go. So, so Dave, apropos that point you're making about about the sister soldier incident, I, I really felt as though it, it it made me think. I mean, it made it very clear to me that 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 the Democrats have had a, a Southern strategy, uh, their own kind of Southern strategy, uh, for a long time now, right? And so that that um, but that it's not it's not overtly talked about in that way. And I just wanted to know. More about about what you think of that, and where do we go? Where do we go from here in, in being critical of that and and uh, moving ahead based on you know that analysis, which I thought was very powerful in the book. Yeah, I think that that the Southern strategy, um, really for both parties uh, in the '80s, say, and, and the '90s, uh, was also always about suburbs and. Uh, People fleeing cities in the in the United States as a whole, and was just as much uh, trying to pick off suburban voters in the Sun Belt and in the North as it was uh, trying to to uh, address the situation uh, in the South, which was kind of out of play in U.S. politics in a big way until just now, just very 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 recently. So I think that was always the case that there was a, a way to, to say we need to speak to Southerners, which really meant we need to go slow on uh, justice issues. But then what Greenberg did was to say, say that in the name of reaching what he was calling sometimes the working class and sometimes the, the middle class and acknowledging that this was a, a suburban strategy as well as a, as a Southern strategy. So one more question has come in in the Q and A. Should we go ahead and take that on, and then and then bid our adieu? Everybody good with that? Okay. The question is for for Dave, David and Minka. I'm currently reading Black Reconstruction with Marxist Education Project. I'm very uh, struck with the parallels slash resonances of that period with the present moment, and a thought often of your work, Season Freedom, in light of the pivotal nature of the 2020 political crises. But many traditional Marxists still hold on to the united cross-racial working class as the primary subject of history and classify race slash gender and sexuality as immaterial. What are your thoughts? Just a little question. <laughs> Go ahead, Minka. Uh, I think I should leave this one to you. I don't, I, I it's a, I'm trying to make sense of it. I, I would just say that I think one of the things that um, I've come to stress with Black Reconstruction is um, that Du Bois is explicitly, and in, in, he does, writes this in The Crisis, I think it's called Marxism and the Negro Problem or the Negro Question, where he's thinking explicitly of how you have to, um, uh, you know, you have to amend and adjust Marxism kind of, you know, what Fanon says, you have to stretch Marxism to deal with race in the US. And I think that you see that um, uh, particularly when he's talking about, you know, the black worker uh, and talking about the enslaved as workers and rethinking the categories of um, Marxism. And you see that across a number of instances and probably most suggestively in um, May Césaire's um, into discourse on colonialism, where he's talking about the proletariat um, as this universal subject. And he's not talking about European workers. He's talking about, um, I think, the colonized. I think that's the, the way we can see that. So he's rethinking what the proletariat uh, would be. And I think this is something consistent across a number of um, 
black Marxists, uh, particularly in the colonial context, but but I think that's part of what Du Bois is doing in Black Reconstruction. But Dave knows this 10 million times better, so I got my two cents in and I'm quiet. Um, I don't, but I, I, uh, I think that equally, it's a discussion of the white worker for the first time by a, a serious discussion of the white worker for the first time by a US uh, intellectual. As far as I can tell, the only other person to write a chapter on the white worker before was Booker T. Washington, who knows if he if he wrote it, but there's a, a chapter that's a very different chapter from Du Bois on the on the white worker and in, in Black Reconstruction. But the only thing that I'll say about Black Reconstruction in that regard in this 2020 uh, moment is that um, it's a curious position to take in 1935. And then the, the uh, Negro question essay that that our Negro problem essay that Mink is alluding to is, is it too. It, 1935, you could already see the CIO. You could already see that black and white unite and fight was, was going to have its moment and or at least had its moment of possibility. And almost every other uh, major African-American intellectual was finding uh, his or her way to that, to that CIO moment. And Du Bois writes a book that avows Marxism and yet doesn't make that move and yet says uh, politically he was for black cooperatives and, and uh, all sorts of other uh, internal to the black community issues at that moment uh, of interracial class solidarity. He wasn't against interracial class solidarity, but I think one way to read uh, his point in black reconstruction is to say that he's saying, you know, uh, this has been tried before and, and white allies aren't always uh, reliable and that therefore black self-activity is still the key in, a, in this sort of a situation. So it's a very complicated staking out of political ground uh, that's going on and what he's doing as an activist at that moment and then what he's doing with black reconstruction. And he does it in the name of Marxism. I mean, he, he doesn't... Uh, in taking this set of positions, he's definitely articulating a black Marxist. So at this point, I wanna thank Scott for his work in organizing and I wanna thank Robert who I mentioned at the beginning. I wanna thank our panelists, especially Aileen for getting up early on a Saturday morning. I wanna thank our participants, which there's 67 people still hanging out with us right now. And first and foremost, I wanna thank Dave for his brilliant body of work that's only gonna to continue to grow and for your friendship. And um, I just really enjoyed this so much. So thank you all.